magic in the air. Hey guys, welcome to Jammin' and Jammies. I'm Megan Barker. We are sitting down with some of our favorite music creators and industry leaders. They're going to share how they got where they are and valuable insights into the music industry. Uh, you can watch the interviews online. You can also tune into the podcast. And we also do a live stream every Sunday night on our Instagram. So make sure you check out jamminandjammies.com for all the details. Today, we are sitting down with Miss Ava Sapelsa, who is a songwriter on the rise, you guys. She's already had songs recorded by Keith Urban, Temecula Road, Austin Burke, Home Free, and more. She's got over 12 million streams, can be heard on Radio Disney, Sirius XM. In 2020, she signed a publishing co-deal with Kingpin Music and Warner Chapel. Also in 2020, Ava founded Hope on the Road, which is an organization that supports the homeless community here in Music City. We obviously have a lot of ground to cover. I'm like out of breath <laughs> talking about your resume. Um, let's dive in. How you doing, Ava? I am doing great. I mean, we're in the middle of a, what, like a once in 10 year snowstorm. So yeah, down doing not, you know, not a lot of leaving, but we're good. <laughs> How are you? Good. I mean, snowstorms, pandemics, we're doing all the things in 2020 slash 2021. I know, seriously, all the unprecedented things. <laughs> Let's just do it. Let's knock them all out. Do you want to just start by telling everyone where you're from and how you got into music? Yeah, totally. So I'm from Evanston, Illinois. It's a suburb right outside of Chicago. Um, and I, I always, I mean, I think it's kind of the same story for a lot of musicians. I always loved singing and I did musical theater. And uh, when Taylor Swift sort of became, you know, a thing when I was 12, maybe 11 or 12, I really, I was like, I want to learn guitar. I got to teach myself. I want to, you know, be like her basically. So I got a guitar, started teaching myself how to play on YouTube and um, writing little songs and all that. And um, my parents let me start like busking downtown Chicago and uh, they would just drive in circles around downtown while I played because I was like 14. So making sure I wasn't gonna get taken or whatever but um and just started playing yeah like bars if they'd let me as a 14 year old coffee shops anywhere street festivals in Chicago and um just fell in love with doing that that kind of just became my summer job my hop like all of the above you know everything and um then when I was 16 I went to Interlock and Arts Academy which is a boarding school in northern Michigan and they have a really cool songwriting singer songwriter program there so it's essentially like pre-college um and so that sort of just they give you all the tips to have a career in music so after that I just sort of continued on and when did you come to Nashville I moved to Nashville in 2017, I think. So I went to Berkeley College of Music for two years in Boston, um, studied songwriting and music business. And then I dropped out uh, after my sophomore year. So I moved here right before my 20th birthday in June of, yeah, 2017. Okay, so if it was only 2017 when you got here, you've done so much since then. It, it seemed like you kind of just knew what to do. Would you agree with that? Or, or was it messy? Because it seems like it all just came together kind of quickly. Well, you know, I think that like there, I had a lot of great advice from people that were just like, I think the, the cool thing about Nashville is that if you do work really hard and people are so nice here and want to help, you know? So I sort of just figured like, all I got to do, I guess, is meet the right people and work my butt off. And so the messy part was just that I was working many, many jobs to pay my rent and, you know, working nine to five, writing six to nine every day. And I didn't sleep much for a couple of years there and was very stressed out. So definitely maybe overworked myself a little bit. Uh, but I think it, you know, it's, it's paid off and I have more downtime now. So yeah. I think the biggest thing was just, you know, getting to know people and meeting people. And, and that was the one thing that I knew, like this town runs on networks and friendships and all that. And so I did know that. And so I was like, okay, I just got to meet people, be nice, be fun, hang out with them. And hopefully it will work. <laughs> Okay, well, two questions, and I'm saying them at the same time so I don't forget. First, um, was being an artist ever on the table, and is it still on the table? And also, um, you know, meeting people, would you agree that sometimes you go to an event and you just meet someone you never expected the night to go that way? Oh, absolutely. Um, so first question, 
I was an artist kind of when I was in college, just because I didn't really know much about writing for other people. That wasn't really an option. Um, so I put out an EP when I was in college, um, did a little bit of that, was playing music under my name, opening up for people and all that. And then pretty much two months or so into moving to Nashville, I just found the writer community here and was like, these are my people. I really would way rather just spend my time being creative than having to, I mean, right now I'm, no, most days I prefer to wear no makeup and just like be, you know, uh, just kind of low key. And that doesn't usually jive with an artist career. So it's definitely not off the table. One day I would love to put out music of my own, just um, kind of in a casual way, I guess, like a, maybe a songwriter type project. We'll see where it takes me. It's who knows what will happen, you know, just keep you never, know. You never know yeah, in, exactly. in the industry. I mean, and it seems like a lot of um, big songwriters are having the opportunity to, to be artists later in their career now. So you never know. Absolutely. Yeah. Natalie Hemby just signed a record deal and, you know, she's doing that. And I, I think that's awesome. And I would love to have a career path like that if I am allowed one day. Um, second question. Yes, totally. Many times I... I found myself out, I mean, the everybody probably knows this, but the main way to meet people in Nashville is at bars. And I obviously moved here when I was 19. So I went through a couple of fake IDs. My parents knew everyone was on board. <laughs> Had a couple of fake IDs. And there were a couple nights, one that like really stands out to me was during CMA week. I wasn't invited to any CMA parties. There's for anyone that's not in Nashville and familiar with it, there's a week long of every company is throwing a party and you kind of have to be invited or like know the details, you know, they don't make it public. So I think it was probably two years ago, I wasn't invited to anything, but I was sort of just like figuring out where to go and like trying to like fake my way into these parties. And I ran into Austin Burke, who's an artist that I work with all the time at one of the parties that I had snuck into. And he was like, hey, come, we're getting an Uber right now. Come with us, we're going to Jesse Frazier's BMI songwriter of the year party and I was like okay sure I had to work I literally had to work at 6 a.m the next morning so I was nannying and it was like midnight I was planning on going to bed early but I was like I have to go so I go and I show up to this I mean I was around people that like Thomas Rhett walked up and was like hey man I love your song and Austin was like I even wrote it and he's like great song I'm Thomas and I was like good oh so that was one of those nights where like I knew I literally got two hours of sleep felt like absolute crap the next day but it was one of those things where I was like I this opportunity may never come again to just like breathe the same air as yeah. these people and just be there and I definitely wasn't supposed to be there but no one knew so that was a fun a fun story about that kind of situation I love stories like that that's what this is all about um I mean you, you just never know and I think you obviously wanted it really bad and you know that you just have to meet people and sometimes you have to just get two hours of sleep that's what we have to do exactly <laughs> live in the dream okay you signed a publishing deal this year can you just tell us a little bit about that as much detail as you're comfortable with but yeah. like um how did you meet your team and how long did you guys kind of date before things escalated all that stuff yes so I that was the my publisher that I'm with right now um her name is Kelly King at Kingpen I'm also with Warner Chapel but it's a joint venture and Kelly was the initial one to um, to want to sign me. And she was the last the last publishing meeting I ever took after taking a lot of them. So I was probably for a year taking meetings. Um, my attorney was setting up meetings. I was setting them up, just sort of meeting people and they were going well. You know, it was one of those things where I would leave being like, I think that went pretty well. And they said they wanted to set me up on rights. And then I wouldn't hear anything and I'd email and I wouldn't hear anything and sort of be ghosted a little bit. And there were definitely a couple of publishers along the way who were really great and, you know, wanted to help me out and set me up on rights. And, but it was definitely a long process. I mean, it felt like at the time it was discouraging because a lot of the artists that I was writing stuff with and for, and they were cutting my songs, they were all signing deals. And I felt like I couldn't, I was taking all these meetings and I was like, I'm playing you the songs that they're getting deals for and I'm but no one wants to sign me and so it was it was definitely disheartening and I think a lot of people have had that experience especially writers because you know when you're an artist there's the additional side of you can write for other people and they're getting in-house cuts with you and if you're just a writer like you have to prove that you're going to be able to make a lot of money for them just on co-writing you know so 
I took about a year of meetings, had a couple things that looked promising. One company that I loved and, and we were in talks and then the entire company shut down, like just stuff like that, where kind of crazy, you know, like everything happens for a reason, but it wasn't very clear at the time that that was, you know, the case. And then in, it must have been July of a year, I guess like a year and a half ago now, I met Kelly King through my BMI rep, Leslie Roberts, who Leslie is incredible. And she, I met her shortly after I moved to Nashville and I didn't even have demos or anything. She heard my work tapes and I guess heard something with it through them because they were not good at all. But she just sort of became like my, my champion and started trying to get me meetings, trying to get me rights. And so she emailed Kelly because Kelly is one of her best friends and said, you need to meet with this girl now basically and so kelly was like sure okay let's meet when are you free this week and we had our first meeting and um we just connected right away i mean she's just like she's so fun she's so great it's like talking to a friend we had a great time and on top of it she liked the songs and i think the cool thing about kelly is that she really she doesn't sign people because other people think it's good. She signs people because she believes in it. She, she trusts her gut feeling. I mean, she signed Brothers Osborne to their first publishing deal 10 years ago. They're still with her. And I mean, you can, she'll talk about it and say like at the time, people were like, why are you signing them? Like bro country is the thing. They're totally not the sound. Like no, nobody understood it. And she was like, I just know that they're good and that this is gonna work. And it ended up working obviously. And, um, and so, I think a lot of Nashville runs off of this idea of like, oh, well, as soon as everyone else likes it, I'll like it and I'll sign them once they have an offer already. And Kelly was just like, if I like you, I'm going to sign you. And she was looking for a female writer at the time too. She didn't have any girls on her roster and it just made sense. So basically our second meeting, I sent her songs. I sent her like 20 songs and our second meeting, um, she set me up on a few rights and then she told me she wanted to sign me. And we pretty much, um, I just knew it felt right. You know, I just wanted somebody that immediately was like, I just know I'm not waiting for other people to convince me otherwise. So I basically told my attorney, like, I just want to run with this. I don't even want to, you know, try and look for other options or whatever. So we started working together in August of a year and a half ago and unofficially, and she got Warner Chapel on board to be the joint venture. And that whole process, the contract negotiation process took about nine months. So I was basically writing for her and she was booking my calendar, pitching my songs, but we didn't actually get it signed until April of this, of 2020. So from August to April and I, so yeah, so that's, um, that's kind of the long story. They're amazing. I love them. Um, they're the best publishers and it's been great since. Wow. Okay. So much to unpack there. First of all, I, I love this. I don't know Kelly and I'm loving what I'm hearing, obviously, because I'm a fan of you and I'm a huge Brothers Osborne fan. And I just love, I think everybody in Nashville knows it's so true that everyone has to kind of be hyped about you before right. you even get an offer. Um, exactly. Yeah. Which, which can be exhausting. And I love how open you are about the frustration because anybody who's been in Nashville for a few years and has gone through pretty much exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, the great meetings and then the disheartening silence and we've, we've all been there. So I love how open you are. Um, so much to unpack. Uh, first of all, how involved is Warner Chapel, if you don't mind me asking, yeah. in booking your rights? Like how involved are they? Are, are you more Kingpin or is it really 50-50? It's definitely more Kingpin. Like they take the, the lead on creative. Um, and it's Harrison Sokoloff, who I think you probably, you know, um, he's awesome. He's my age, he's 23 and he is the, uh, it's him and Kelly at Kingpen. And so they do the majority, I mean, I'm t I talk to them every day, like back and forth texting. So they're sort of like my main people, but I also have a point person over at Warner Chapel. Her name is Christina Wilshire. She's amazing. I love her. She is so great. And so she will sort of add to things in my calendar and she'll text me and say like, Hey, I saw you have an open day. You know, do you want to jump on this right that I, you know, have with so-and-so needs a third or whatever. Um, and so especially with things within Warner Chapel, because it's such a big company, they're great where they'll say like, look, if you want to write with someone at Warner Chapel, we'll try and set that up. And um, so they sort of bring in their 
their network. Um, and they're, I mean, they're, they're great. There's so many great people over there that um, they have a lot of writers. So it's nice to have Kelly and Harrison where I'm one of four writers at their company. So I get a lot of individualized attention from them and I'm their only really only developing writer. Everyone else that they've signed has sort of advanced past the point of like, you know, the first year of their deal or whatever. So they really have been able to invest a lot of time in me. And um, Christina at Warner Chapel has a pretty big roster. So she's definitely got a lot on her plate, but she is great about, you know, we talk pretty regularly. She gets me and writes, they pitch my songs, they have a sync department. So they sort of take some of that stuff. So I would say it's like, 80 20 but they're definitely involved it sounds ideal almost because you've kind of got the best of both worlds absolutely yeah no it really is I couldn't be happier with the way it worked out that's awesome okay you mentioned um what is it like being a rising female writer in Nashville what does that mean to you well I think there are so many incredible uh female writers right now that are just like dominating the charts and and just absolutely killing it that especially lately I've gotten to know some of them and they've really um shown that yes there is a huge gender disparity in Nashville right now but especially like Laura Veltz for example is somebody that I have recently become friends with she's amazing and she is you know many 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 number ones at this point and and just totally kicking butt as a writer and and I think like seeing people like that Heather Morgan all these incredible female writers that have risen just there's a certain amount of longevity I feel like in a female writer's career too where from what you see at least and this isn't to you know generalize everyone's careers but the female writers that do well do well for a long time like Hillary Lindsay you know you look at number ones over 10, 15 years, you know? So it's, I think that that's a cool thing about it is that it's not really usually like a flash in the pan type career. Cause, cause I think women, female writers have to work harder to some degree and have to prove themselves a little more to some degree. So that pays off in the long run, you know, if you have to do that. Um, personally though, I have never really experienced anything that's made me feel like I haven't gotten certain things because I am a female writer. The The only thing I've noticed is that, especially when I was taking meetings, there's a lot of, oh, well, we just signed a, a woman, so we don't want to sign another one. Um, and that's kind of like one of those things where like, we have five male writers. Why can you only have one female writer? Yeah, but yeah. I will say with, you know, female artists that are really I think that the insurgence of female artists is coming back that 90s sort of Faith Hill thing is it's coming back around the opposite has been happening where I, I heard of multiple companies that were like we need a strong female top liner who's not an artist because we need to be able to have a female writer to bring in the room with Kelsey Ballerini and and these female artists to have that female perspective because that you add so much to write if you're writing a female story. It's like, you don't want a bunch of dudes in there doing that. So I do know that there is an increasing need for female writers right now, um, especially top liners and track women, all of that. So I think it's an exciting time to be uh, a woman in country music. Definitely there's extra work that has to be put in, but I think it looks promising. Yeah, I don't think extra work scares you, Ava. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I may have had a problem with working a little too hard in the past. I've sort of leveled that out now, though. No, that's okay. I understand. You know, I think you're right. I think, yeah, there's not a ton of female right now. I mean, I think it's coming back around. And you know what? That just leaves more room to leave a mark. And I think you're right. I think people like Hillary Lindsay, yeah, they're going to be remembered forever. So it is an exciting time. And I love how cute and passionate and excited you are. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> okay. So have you heard your song on the radio yet? You've heard it on Radio Disney and Sirius. So yes. I, you know, I haven't, I don't have any songs that have like gone to radio officially where I would just hear it, you know, like yeah. on FM radio. I've heard a couple of them on Radio Disney and on Sirius XM, um, but nothing on FM radio yet. Hopefully one day, fingers crossed, we'll <laughs> see. I know they have been played here and there in different cities and I've heard like video clips of it, but yeah. nothing where I've like, oh, wow, I'm driving in my car and there it is. <laughs> 
but that's the goal. Maybe one day. <laughs> one day soon. One day soon. It'll be soon. Um, but you did hear your song performed at the Ryman. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I wrote a song with this band called Home Free. They're an acapella country band, which is a really cool sort of They're niche. Yeah. Um, they, they really are incredible. And they did two nights at uh, the Ryman sold out and um i have a song on their most recent record so got to go see them play that one and then um at the opry not at the ryan but the opry i temecula road played a song and i wrote with them there i didn't get to see it in person but i saw a video and same thing with austin burke i got to see him play one that we wrote at the opry together which was pretty cool i mean what is that like in those moments i mean are you a really emotional person are you kind of logical and business minded you're like oh that's cool or do you get like oh my god it's so amazing <laughs> i'm definitely an emotional person um pretty much all the time i feel like as especially early on i was like oh my god everything is amazing and exciting and as as time has gone on a little bit there's it definitely like levels out where if you let yourself get extremely excited about things you also get extremely disappointed about things is what I've found so I try my best now to kind of keep things I get excited and I still get disappointed but if you don't let yourself you know run with oh my god now I'm gonna be on the radio and then I'm gonna be a number one writer and then and then when that doesn't happen that is soul crushing right so I, I try and not get too crazy emotional about about even the positive things so that the negative things can be yeah. you know sort of more like yeah. take it all in stride so I would say kind of 50 50 there yeah I love it take us into your vision board uh what are some of your goals what's next for you it's a good question um well I my goals are writing wise I obviously would love to have a song on the radio a hit a number one you know hearing um artists that I love and have loved for a long time sing songs like there's obviously like the dream cuts like little big town lady antebellum lady a now um people like that were like that is a dream i would love that one thing that i really really in my career is a goal is to cross over into pop in some degree i love writing pop music so um whether that's like you know if that was a country sort of pop collab thing or actually going to LA and writing there and being able to have some success there that's definitely like a dream bucket list thing um and then we haven't really talked about it yet but my organization hope on the row um that's become a really big part of my day-to-day -day now and so I definitely see that I would love to see that grow and continue over the next you know, the length of my career. And, and that's definitely like a big goal and vision that I have for that. Well, that's actually a perfect segue. Do you want to tell everyone, <laughs> how did it all come to be? Tell us about Hope on the Row. Yeah. So, oh my gosh, it's a crazy, it's been a whirlwind. It's been about seven or eight months since I started it, but basically in June, um, I was, I mean, it was mid pandemic on top of that, George Floyd had just been murdered. There was the sort of the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and and I was feeling especially helpless like there was just so much going on in the world. I'm, I'm a very much an empath and and I feel things a lot. So I was watching these videos of, you know, protesters being just so many things that were like really, really hurting my heart and I couldn't even leave my house really. So I was like, I don't know. I want to do something. I can't really do much besides give money or things which I was doing and um one thing that I was able to do though was take you know drives basically I was just driving around because I needed to do something with myself and I've always uh loved to put together little care packages for people that I do see on the street especially like at in Nashville at a lot of red lights and stuff you'll see people on the street that need a little help and so I started, you know, being like, well, this is something I can do from the safety of my car, COVID wise, I can at least pass out some stuff. And, and I was reading articles about just the number of evictions and just across the nation, the numbers of people that are currently homeless were just rising so rapidly that felt like that was something I could at least do a little bit of hands-on and feel like I'm honestly, selfishly feel like I'm doing something. 
because it was hard to you know sit on your hands and be like I can't do anything about all these horrible things that are happening so I posted on my Instagram just being like hey if you guys have you know if you want to donate like some supplies or whatever or money here's my Venmo I'm just going to make these little care packages thinking I'd get you know 100 bucks 200 bucks and I ended up getting like $3,000 in my Venmo from people, some people I didn't even know, but a lot of it was people within Nashville's music community who, you know, wanted to help like a lot of writers like myself, I didn't lose my job or anything. I'm still writing on Zoom. And so a lot of people like that, they were like, I haven't been affected by any of this, but I want to help, but I don't know how, you know, I think there's something about small grassroots sort of boots on the ground organizations and people where you can actually see what's happening with your money rather than it's great to donate to the Red Cross and things like that. But you have, that's going into the sphere of, you know, you have no idea what's happening with your 20 bucks, but 20 bucks to someone who's doing what I'm doing is a lot. <laughs> that's, you know, a toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, everything for one person. So I got all this money and was super overwhelmed and ended up uh, being able to get supplies and pass things out to so many people. And it was a conversation I had with the publisher, actually a friend of mine, where she said, uh, she works at Smack, and she was like, you know, we always donate to organizations like what you're doing, like all the publishers love, they have a fund for, you know, donating to charities, like you should make this a thing, because I think people would love to donate to someone that they actually know personally that's doing this work, and that you can see it happening, and I was like, I don't know if I'm capable of running a nonprofit, but maybe why not? And so I talked to my boyfriend, Tristan, a lot, talked to my parents a lot. And I think they were like, sure, are you sure you want to do this? Like, that's great, but you know, good luck. And um, I've always been somebody that's, I'm very much not a perfectionist. I figure I'll figure it out as I go, jump in. And then, so I basically just like made a logo, an Instagram page and was like, all right, I'm doing this. I'll figure it out as I go. And applied for nonprofit status. And um, it has just grown so much over the last seven months where we, uh, we have served hundreds and hundreds of people and helped people with shelter and, you know, start to find permanent housing. And um, it's, it's really been amazing. And, and the biggest thing I think was seeing the way Nashville's music community, Hope Row, Music Row, that's where Hope on the Row comes from, seeing the way that everybody in the music community has banded together to help you know I think people just they want to be involved and they want to help they just need an outlet and they need something that they can trust so I, it's been really awesome to be able to be that for people where they feel confident sending 50 bucks or whatever to know that it's going to people in your own neighborhood you know well I think most people want to help in general but I think people really want to help in their own community so it's amazing what exactly like what you said that people know where the money's going and you post on Instagram and you can see I mean if, if you're not comfortable going down there right now and meeting these people face to face yeah. you're posting on Instagram and you can see the faces of people that you're helping and another thing too I I'm not sure privileged people like myself and we don't realize how quickly things can be taken away from you I mean you lose yeah. your job things can go south really fast. And I don't think um, people realize how quickly things can unravel. So yeah. it's really near and dear to my heart. And I want to come down and help sometime when this is all less okay. crazy. And thank you for what you do. It's really amazing. Thank you. It's been great. I mean, and a lot of it is not me. It's people. Yeah. We have so many awesome volunteers that come. I mean, I do a lot of the organizational work for it. And there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff, but it would not be possible without the people that have donated money and time and supplies and you know it's that's been able to make this happen it wouldn't it literally would not be possible with just me so it's been awesome the amount of people that have sort of adopted it as their own little yeah you know baby charity as well so it's been great uh, what do you see for the future? I mean, just keep expanding, just keep helping, just get as many people involved as possible. I mean, do you think it could maybe get too big for just little Ava to handle? <laughs> yes, Hopefully. it definitely will. It's already getting to the point where I'm like hiring an intern and stuff because I really can't, I cannot do it all by myself. But um, I definitely would just love to keep growing it. I mean, ideally, what I would love to be able to do is right now, weekly, we go out every Sunday and we're, we serve food um, drinks, we pass out clothing, supplies, all that. I would love to be able to have a couple days a week where this is happening, 
where I can train people to run these, where I don't have to be present at every single thing. I've already got a couple volunteers who have come every week where they can absolutely lead this without me and make this happen. And it runs super smoothly. So that has been a really important transition where just getting enough people confident enough in the place where that uh, we can have this happening without me having to be there every step of the way. Cause that's, you know, I can't be in a million places at once. So that is one goal. And then the other thing is just, I'm starting to do my best to learn about the affordable housing yeah. process, section eight housing. Um, there's just, there's not enough low income housing and it's a very, very, very difficult process to navigate. I mean, I have a laptop, I have you know, a partial college education and I'm struggling to understand all of this stuff through the government and the IRS. And it's just, it's so complicated. So if you imagine not having a computer, not having a phone, how are you supposed to call the housing offices and do all this stuff to get yourself out of homelessness? So that's something that I'm starting to learn about and um, sort of get a better handle on where ideally I would love to be at the place where we have the connections and the relationships to be able to move, literally move people off the street. We have a couple people that I've been working with personally over the last couple months that have made huge progress. And I think within the next year, we'll probably be in permanent housing. Um, and so if I can sort of figure out how that process works start to finish, that's the goal really is to be able to place people in housing um, rather than serving food and all that is so helpful and amazing. But um, being able to end that cycle for a few people. That is the goal long-term. Real change. You're inspiring real change in people's lives. It's amazing. It's, um, it's a special thing to be a part of. That's for sure. Has this inspired your music at all? I mean, it, it definitely has brought perspective into my career and my life. I mean, that's, there are times when I think, you know, I'll be like, oh, I'm so stressed out. I have a double today or I have to whatever. And then, you know, I get a text from someone that's like, hey, can you help us with, you know, getting a hotel for the night? Because it's three degrees and snowing. And it's like, okay, the fact that I'm stressed out about, I mean, music is so important and we need music. And I would never want to say that it's not an important thing and it helps so many people. But it is important, I think, to have perspective in like the things that I get stressed out about in my career and in my day to day as a songwriter is is nothing when you put it in perspective with what so many people are are living in and 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 grateful and happy and sweet. I mean, these people that I have become friends with now are like they are just have the most positive attitudes and and are so much more grateful than, you know, a lot of people that I know that are yeah. in much, much better situations, myself included. I think it's, it's just given me a huge reality check and made me grateful, more grateful for my, to be able to have a publishing deal, get paid to write songs, have an apartment and, you know, have a family that supports what I do. Like all of that, I think is the biggest thing that it's affected my music in that way, where I just, there's just more perspective now. What a wonderful life experience to have early on. I mean, I think some people go a lot longer than you have without that perspective. So I'm really glad for everything you're doing and how it's affecting you. And do um, you want to play a song for us? Sure. All right. It is, uh, it's not even morning anymore, but for me, it's like sort of still morning. <laughs> still morning. It's before three o'clock in the afternoon. It's yeah, still it's morning. It's before three and I'm a songwriter, so it's morning. <laughs> um, so this song... Uh, you mentioned it in the in the bio, but one of the craziest and coolest things, I guess, that's happened this year is uh, that by some crazy string of events, um, a song that I wrote got to Keith Urban, and he loved it and recorded it in June, and it didn't make his first project, but like fingers crossed that it makes his second project, the part two. If not, you know, at least I've heard him sing my song. Yeah. So like, that's enough for me. I can die happy now. Um, but this is that song. It's called You Tell Me. Fingers crossed that you guys actually hear him singing it one day. But if not, you can hear me sing it. So, <laughs> And I wrote this with um, Blake Hubbard, Jared Ingram, who are two producers at Warner Chapel, and Stephen Lee Olson, who is an incredible top liner and writer. He wrote Blue Ain't Your Color. So he's the Keith Urban connect there. Um, and so just happy to have been in the room with them that day for sure. 
And it was a Zoom right, so crazy, right? Yes, oh my God, come in. <laughs> Zoom rights can make it all the way to Keith Urban. All right. Got your shampoo in my shower, your toothbrush on my sink, the top drawer on my dresser's yours. What am I supposed to think? When you call me, then you disappear, then you're over me, then you're overhearing a whiskey whisper in my ear. You tell me, you tell me. That you love me and you mean it's stupid me I just believe it then you tell me it's just a 2 a.m. drop will be yeah you're hot and then you're colder and it's hard for me to tell lately what we doing in this bed baby so you tell me yeah you tell me tell me tell me why I leave the light on why I leave the door unlocked I don't know why I do it, why I save a parking spot when I don't know if you're mine for losing and you're out, you're so damn confusing. You tell me that you love me and you mean it's stupid me, I just believe it then. You tell me it's just a 2 a.m. drop will be yeah, you're hot and then you're cooler and it's hard for me to tell it. So Keith Urban is like my main man. I have a poster right here. I've had it for like 15. <laughs> so I'm just going to manifest to Keith right here for you. Oh my God, please do. I know. I love him too. My mom is also in love with him. She always <laughs> says like the two sexiest men are my husband and Keith Urban. So oh. I was like, got to tell her like, mom, guess what? I called her when I found out he put it on hold and she, I mean, like, I think she cried more than I did. So that was one moment where I did get emotional. I definitely cried, especially when Stephen Lee Olson played the recording of Keith singing it, that, I mean, that his voice is just, it's so distinct and I've been hearing it, I mean, my whole life, you know, I've loved his music. So hearing him sing my words that I helped write was very much an emotional experience for me, so. Okay, mind blowing. Um, okay, just a couple more questions before I let you go. This is, this is so great. Um, what do you look for in a co-writer and what's something important that you learned about co-writing? It's a great question. Um, so I think like the people that I find that I love the most as co-writers, sometimes it's because they're just incredible writers. You know, like there is something about talent that you can't replace. And there are people that you know, you get in the room with them and you're like, how did you come up with that? I would never think of that. Like, it's just unbelievable. Um, so there are people, that is one thing that is obviously, but, but I think that there's an element of, there are people that I find that I write better when they're in the room. I don't know what it is. It's something about their personality. It's something about the way they are encouraging. Like, I think we all do better when maybe not everybody, but at least I do better when I know people like what I'm doing. So if I'm in the room with somebody who 
gets excited and is supportive of my ideas and obviously has good ideas of their own, um, I find that I write better. So I, I really look like my main, my favorite people to write with are the people that um, make me feel more confident as a writer really is what it comes down to. Um, and that bring in just like really great ideas, bringing in great titles and, and concepts, yeah. you know, cause I think a lot of times as a top liner, it can fall on you to do that. So I, I, if I am in a ride and I'm like, crap, I have a couple ideas maybe that are decent because I'm done. It's Friday and I've written all my ideas. If someone comes in with a totally badass idea, it's like, that is, I'm, I remember that. I'm like, Oh my God, thank God. They also <laughs> contribute, you know, there's, it's not just, you know, on, me or another co-writer to come up with that stuff. So it's important for you to feel comfortable. I think that's only natural. Um, do you think that you've kind of turned that around and you try to make other people feel comfortable as well? Yeah, I think that, I mean, a lot of times, like, especially in publishing meetings, they'll ask what, you know, what do you, what's your skill as a co-writer? What do you bring to the table? And I, I think that that is one of the things about myself as a co-writer that I feel confident about is that um, I, I'm less concerned. So this is advice that was given to me actually by a publisher that sort of was helping me out a couple years ago. And he said, I am way less concerned that my writer gets a cut on the first right than them getting a second right. It is way more important to get a second right with somebody than write the best song ever. Cause you can write the best song ever with them. They can cut it and they could have hated the entire process. They could have hated that you fought for your lines. Cause maybe your lines were better. You know, maybe the song was better because you fought for your lines, but if you made them feel dumb or like a bad writer, or you just bulldozed over all their ideas, you're never going to write with them again. So it doesn't matter if you got a cut, you might get a, you know, a couple bucks from Spotify and maybe a name that you can say you had a cut with, but it's like, so my, my main thing has always been, even if, you know, it's give and take. So if I think my idea is better, but, you know, I've already fought for one of my ideas, it's about being like, let's go with, you know, let's go with your idea or whatever. And, and I think that having that sort of seeing it as a, it's, it's so back and forth and it's a conversation and a friendship and all that in, you know, in one session, approaching it that way has, I think, helped me with getting, forming relationships long term we know i've been writing with the same artists since before they signed record deals or whatever things like that where i'm in their group now i'm in their go-to where they when someone asks who do you like to write with i'm in their some of their top five co-writers you know and that comes from just being just making it a pleasant experience you know and making them feel comfortable as much as you want to feel comfortable yeah, I think I, that was my next question was, what's the best advice you've ever gotten? And, and maybe that's it. I think it's more about the long game and forming relationships than getting cuts. Because I think getting cuts will come with those good relationships. Absolutely. Exactly. So yeah, I think that that's best. like some of the best advice I ever got. It's a guy named Mike Daly, who he does a &R for Disney Publishing and um, Hollywood Records. He sort of took me under his wing um, two years ago got me, introduced me to my attorney. Just, he's awesome. He lives in LA, but he helped me a lot early on. And he told me that where he was like, it is so much more important to get a second right and to create those relationships. And so I think when I switched my focus to that, things really happened maybe differently for me than they would have had I been just focused on always getting, because you see those people that just want to get the best song, even if it means kind of hurting people's feelings. And there is something to that, you know, those, there are those writers where you're like, they're really, really good and their ideas are great. And I'm not gonna argue with that at all. And that may work for them in some, it's just picking how you wanna play the game really, you know? And my thing is I hate having my feelings hurt. I'm a sensitive person. I mean, I'm not yeah. a crybaby, but I like to, you know, I, I leave rights. I'll remember if someone made me feel dumb for an idea and I probably won't wanna write with them again. And so I would never wanna do that to somebody and I hope I never have. And so that's kind of been my main thing is like, it should be a pleasant experience. We do this because we love it. Yeah. It should not be like, you shouldn't leave feeling like an idiot. You know, none of us are here. None of us are bad writers. If you're in this situation, like your ideas have something to them that are good. And, you know, I think that it's just important to remember that about other people as well as yourself yeah great advice for us all i think we all needed that okay one final question um and i know that we've kept you late this has been so great no, i'm oh, no today got the day off <laughs> <laughs> this is great okay last question um 
you know, for people that have maybe been doing this for a while and maybe it didn't happen as quickly as they thought, there are dark moments, there are hard moments. We've talked a little bit about this. What kept you going or what would you say to them to keep people going? Wow, yeah. Um, I, I think there's a couple answers to this. One of them is finding people that you admire and love and that have had a career that you would love to have and looking at their backstory. And I remember hearing, you know, Shane McAnally on a podcast and when I was feeling frustrated because I'd been here for two years and hadn't had anything. And he's talking about 10 years of nothing. And then hearing his song on the radio while he was washing dishes in a restaurant, like that type of thing, finding people that you love and seeing that it's not an overnight thing and that everyone really does have their own. For some people it is overnight. I mean, I'm not going to lie. There are people and I've seen it where they move here and six months later, they have a record deal. And like, that is great. And I would never wish them anything but success, but that is usually not the case, but it usually doesn't have to do with talent or whether you're a good person or not. It's, it's, I really believe that everyone has their own path and something that another great piece of advice I got from a writer who's been in town for a long time was when I was really frustrated that things and just like sad, I guess, and down on myself, he said, you know, a lot of times the people that end up sticking around in Nashville the longest are the ones that had to fight for it early on because if you get everything handed to you right away when it doesn't go right one day you are not going to have the ability to stick it out where if you are you know working in restaurants I, I was I've worked in restaurants for the last couple of years before signing my deal and among many many other jobs but I remember like this is just a very specific memory but at one of the restaurants I had to hand make lemonade for the restaurant. And I remember like being in the back of the kitchen, making the lemonade and being like one day, I love the And the Writer Is podcast. I listen to that all the time. And I'm making the lemonade and I was like, I think I'd been here six months. And I was like, one day I'm going to be on that podcast talking about how I was making this lemonade and like no one would write with me and whatever. So I think like finding people that have a story where they really, you know, stuck it out and remembering that and just keeping that in the back of your mind all the time is super important. Um, and also just remembering why you do it. You know, I think we get so caught up in whether or not other people like what we're doing or whether or not it's working and yes, getting paid is important, but there was a, a period of time where I wasn't writing because I loved writing, you know, I was writing because I wanted a publishing deal. I was writing because I wanted cuts. I was writing because I wanted whatever thing. And, and I think it's important to get back to that you know, your 13 year old self that wrote yeah. songs on your bedroom floor by yourself and, and making sure you nurture that part of yourself as well. Um, last thing I would say, therapy. I was going to see a therapist. Like, I mean, I've been seeing a therapist for a long time. I'm always like so pro therapy, but I, you, it is so lonely to be going through these ups and downs of a career like this by yourself. And there are a lot of people who don't understand it unless they are literally going through it at the same time as you. So having somebody that you can talk to about that, that is good at their job as a therapist for me was super helpful because I was like, before I started talking to her, I was these super high, super low. It was just like every other week I was, you know, somewhere else. And she was like, we need to level this out. First of all, you need a hobby. So she encouraged me to find something. Honestly, this was really important for me. She basically was like, what do you like to do besides music? And I had no answers for her. And she was like, not, don't say working out. Don't say cooking things that you have to do. You have to do those things. What do you do that you don't have to do besides music? And I literally did not have an answer because oh, that's all funny. I did. Well, yeah. And all, so basically all my eggs were in this one basket. So of course, when that, when your music basket is not going well and all your eggs are in it, you're, you attach your, you as a person to your job, you know? So it's not Ava the human, it's Ava the songwriter. So when Ava the songwriter isn't doing well and that's my only identity, it feels like Ava the human isn't doing well. So as soon as I was able to like find things that add value to my life that aren't like Hope on the Road is a huge one for me where my music career can be totally shitty one week, you know, I could have had the worst week of rights, but if I helped, you know, get a couple of people off the streets that week, at least Ava the human feels like I did, you know, I feel good about that, even if Ava the songwriter feels like crap for whatever reason. So that is something that 
I didn't do for so long that I'm so happy that I, I figured out with the help of a therapist by, by now, because we are so much more than just our jobs, you know? Uh, so much great insight. You're wise beyond your years. All that therapy is paying <laughs> off because now you're being a therapist for so many people. Um, and it's kind of full circle because it's a different podcast and you didn't hear your song on the radio, but you're talking about Keith Urban singing your song on a podcast. So you're almost there, yeah, right? Yeah. Awesome. This has been so amazing. So much insight. I can't believe we've kept you as long as we have, but it's been great. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for taking the time. We're probably here because my answers are so long-winded. I haven't talked <laughs> to humans for, for a while. So. No, no, it's literally chock full of great info. People are going to love all this inspiration. So I'm so excited for you and the best is yet to come. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. You are just the best. And I love what you've created with this. I remember when you started Jammin' and Jammies. Like literally, <laughs> I remember the first one. I was like, I played one of the first five or six, I think, at Gosh. South whatever that bar was at the time. Now it's, is that live? Oak? I don't know what it is now. I think it's closed. It, last time I was there a year ago, it was closed. I don't even know anymore. Well, it's I remember crazy. playing like in your first, maybe like month of shows and stuff. So it's really awesome what you've created. Really cool to watch. Thank you so much. It's been a journey. <laughs> <laughs> All really right. is. Keep keep going. Don't quit. We'll get through the pandemic. We'll get through the snowstorm. It's all going to be good. And we'll see you soon. We'll catch up after your next radio hit. Uh, well, hope, fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. You stay well, okay? You as well. Thank you so much, Megan. Bye. What y'all trying to do? What y'all trying to do?